Builders Risk Program Man Manager for Victor Oshinner, and I will turn it over to him. Good afternoon. Hope everybody's having a good day. Uh, appreciate Donna introducing me. My name is Jeff Benson. And this is going to be a little different. Classify uh, a risk, and there's we're going to stick to uh, you know pretty strict rules as far as you know. Th this is not really a subjective topic. You know, when they build a building or when there's a, a structure out there, it fits into one of these classifications. So we're actually going to talk about we're, we're actually going to talk about how you classify them properly. And there's a lot of reasons that that make it. Uh, very important. Make sure you have the proper classification. We have a little issue with the with the webinar. Hang on just a second. All right. So let's go ahead and jump into it. We're going to have a question period at the end of this too. So any questions, uh, bear with us. So the, kind of to, to put this in perspective today, we're going we're gonna to dive right in. We're going to talk about ISO construction classification. Some of you have probably heard of the International Building Classification and Coding System. That's something a little different. This is ISO, and I think most people use ISO to determine these construction types. Uh, and even though we're going to emphasize builder's risk today, course of construction, it really applies to permanent property insurance too. So when you look at an existing building, uh, people down here in Jacksonville will laugh at me because every time I'm driving around, I'm trying to classify something. Sometimes from looking at it from the exterior, you can't classify it correctly. You actually have to understand certain parameters in order to get the proper classification. So we'll talk about that. And uh, then we'll have questions at the end. So to kind of keep this moving along, we're going to say, what are the two important factors in determining a construction classification? First of all, the building elements, just like it sounds. You know, what is the building made out of? What's the materials and fire resistance and the thickness and things of that nature? Uh, and then secondly, the fire resistance rating. And I will say they're constantly coming up with new construction materials. Uh, you know, they now have concrete that sets up in sub-zero temperatures. Uh, so it's a fascinating thing. It changes all the time. The fire rating changes. I will say uh, there is nothing that's fireproof. There is only materials that are fire resistant, and we'll talk about that in a few minutes. In order to answer to properly classify a building, you have to answer the following questions. And I always I go back to this. This is not a subjective, you know, you're going to convince an underwriter one thing or another. There, there is a right answer here for each each building being built or each building. There's a right answer. So, what materials make up the frame of the building? So we can talk about all of we'll, we'll talk about each different type of material, but that's the question you got to ask yourself. What materials make up the frame? What materials make up the interior and exterior walls? Sometimes there are multiple materials in the same wall. We'll talk about that. Kind of interesting too. What materials make up the floor construction? What materials make up the roof construction? And what is the fire rating of these materials? We'll talk a little bit about fire rating. It's really just resistance to fire, and there's a, a, a time that's put on different materials from, you know, less than, from no fire rating to less than an hour, or less than two hours, so on and so forth. And we'll talk about that. So why, why is it important to get the right classification? We're going to give you some reasons of why I think it's very critical to property underwriting and from an agency standpoint to get these things correct. First of all, I mean, we're trying to classify it correctly so we, we have a very good idea of how this thing will perform in certain instances. Uh, you know, fire, uh, earth movement, windstorm, you know, water damage, all of those things. They all affect that. So it's very critical to turn that. We'll talk a little bit about catastrophic exposures, and I'll give you a little idea. We're going to talk a little bit geographically. I'll give you some ideas. There are very different construction techniques on the West Coast as opposed to the Southeast, the Northeast, uh, and the Midwest. And we'll talk a little bit about that. And finally, insurance cost. We got to get it correct in order to make sure that we're charging the right insurance. Simple as that. Pretty, pretty, uh, pretty uh, simple. All right. So we're going to start with the material that we're all very familiar with, and this is the uh, this does generate the highest premium, and it's frame construction. In residential construction, detached single family, 93% of all homes are framed. That's just a fact. 93% of all homes in the United States are frame construction. 
So when you're thinking about that, just remember, there's a better than average chance it's frame when we're looking at a house being built. Commercial structures are a little different. Uh, there's still a lot of frame commercial structures being built too. Uh, when you think of habitational structures, primarily frame, uh, what do we see a lot? Assisted living facilities, a lot of frame. We see a lot of frame hotels, new hotels being built, frame. So I'm just giving you some real life examples of things we see every day on the frame side. Buildings with interior walls, exterior walls, floors and roofs made with combustible materials, usually wood. Okay, so it's wood. Sometimes exterior walls are even constructed, constructed with this uh, non-combustible or slow burning materials. The use of masonry and veneer and metal clad do not change the classification. We see a lot of people get confused when they see a house and it looks like a stucco house, very prevalent in the southeast. It's a frame house with a stucco veneer exterior. That is classified as frame. It's not joist and masonry, it's frame, and we'll get to that in a little bit. We see a lot of mixed construction. I'm sure those of you on the West Coast can talk about that, where we see masonry non-combustible in the first two floors, and then two or three or four floors above that will be frame construction. So one of the basic premise of all property underwriters is the next uh, property underwriting uh, criteria is the next thing. The risk is underwritten based on the weakest point of the structure. So every day we get calls and the agent says, yeah, it's, it's a masonry building, it's just wood on the top of it. Uh, we always kind of chuckle now because that is a frame building, uh, the weakest point. Even if it's only one floor frame, it is a frame building. Just remember that. Firewalls and sprinkler systems, you hear a lot about those that talked about in permanent property insurance, and they are considered uh, an underwriting criteria even in builder's risk when the building's nearing completion. So the building's 90% completed pending closing, and if the sprinkler systems are not functioning, if the firewalls were not part of the code correctly, you know, or whatever, that could affect uh, the, the, you know, what happens to that building. And if you think about a renovation remodeling project, uh, obviously the way the building was built initially is very, is critical to the underwriting aspect of this. And as you can see some nice little pictures, those look like frame buildings. And if it looks like frame, probably is frame. There are some advantages to using frame construction. It's easy to build. Uh, you know, depending on the price of lumber, usually it's more cost effective. Uh, it's relatively easy to find experienced carpenters. So that part of the labor is a little better. Uh, so it's economical. And for those of our friends on the West Coast, especially up there in Alaska today, uh, it does perform well in earthquake. A little more give to it than other types of construction. So you see a lot of frame buildings being built on the West Coast, even commercial structures frame. We understand that. The disadvantages to frame is once again, it burns very easily. There's no fire resistance rating to frame. I do get a kick out of the fact when agents say, oh, you know, these buildings will never burn down. I can send you pictures of, you know, 30, 40, 50 million dollar frame apartment complexes that are fully engulfed and they do burn down once in a while. That happens. Uh, highly damageable may become unstable in a fire. So when a frame building catches on fire on the lower floors, we got a problem. You know, it's usually going to be a total loss. Uh, may include enclosed spaces where fire can spread undetected. It's just so flammable that the fire can be burning anywhere in the building. And lastly, the disadvantage is the increased insurance cost. I will touch on this real quick. We've seen this kind of happening more in the, the southeast, specifically in South Florida. Because of insurance costs, you're seeing less and less frame construction taking place. It's better to go ahead and build a masonry building, it performs better in the wind, performs better in the, in the fires, and even though it costs more initially, uh, the carrying cost of a masonry building in the southeast now is less than frame. So just something you might see in the future as time goes on in other places. Joisted masonry. One of my favorites, okay, I see this classification a lot and usually people get it wrong. Give it, remember when I said 93% of all single family homes are framed, the other 7% are joisted masonry. And I'll give you a very, one like a picture of one. So you have a concrete block structure, concrete block walls, nothing else in the walls but concrete block. And then you have wood trusses. That is the classic joisted masonry building. And they do build those. It's just sometimes it's hard to find laborers that know how to lay the block. Uh, and there's a little more cost, probably adds 25 to 30 percent more to the cost of a project to build it out of masonry. But joist of masonry, if you see, we write some older buildings, 
uh, I've seen uh, that was more prevalent probably 100 years ago. You see a lot of concrete buildings with heavy timber, wood, wood uh, trusses. Those do perform much better than frame in a fire, and they will you will get the, a better rate. Uh, and usually there's more capacity out in the marketplace for joisted masonry. Uh, so we do like to, you know, underwriters like joisted masonry. We just got to make sure it is true joisted masonry. It's not frame. So, and then I'll just say this too. The best advice I can give all agents is when in doubt, you know, pick up the phone and call the underwriter. Have a little discussion with them. Advantages, it's harder to ignite. Joisted masonry does better in, the, in a fire. Uh, more structural stability, even in the event of a, you know, like in the wind, it performs much better in the wind. Uh, Earth movement is something we can talk about probably. We'll have a whole other webinar on Earth movement one time. And greater salvage value. You can have a fire in a joisted masonry building and still have, you know, you might be able to, you know, retain the walls and just build everything else that was damaged. Whereas if it's frame, or we'll get to non-combustible in a second, when you have a fire in those buildings, many times it's a total loss. Greater salvage value. Disadvantages, floors and roofs are combustible materials subject to damage by fire. Once again, the weakest point of a joist and masonry building is the wood trusses. You got frame, so it kind of makes it not quite as good. Next one, non-combustible. This gets a little tricky. Here's where we start getting into, people usually get this wrong. So non-combustible, buildings with exterior walls, floors, roofs, and supports made up of slow burning and non-combustible materials. Uh, to give you an idea of a true NC would be like uh, a mini warehouse. Many times I see those being built around the country. Those are usually non-combustible. Uh, aircraft hangers, non-combustible. Uh, even barns and things like that, the sheds, storage sheds, little warehouses. A lot of these things are non-combustible. So maybe a little better than frame from, in some aspects. In some aspects, no better than frame. Uh, you do see multi-story non-combustible construction. A lot of times you'll see the floors are concrete and then you have a steel frame and a steel deck. Uh, what we're going to get to is the fire resistance, fire rating of the walls to determine if it meets the next classification. So from a non-combustible standpoint, the advantage is it's easy to build. I mean, you see these things being built in rural, rural areas for sheds and stuff. They can put them up very quickly. Sometimes in a week or two, they can build a pretty, you know, large aircraft hangar. Uh, so they're economical, depending, you know, by per square foot. One of the most economical ways to build a building. But here comes some major disadvantages. Contained steel would lose the strength at high temperatures. When a fire does take place in a non-combustible building, you have warping. Uh, a lot of times the structural integrity of the thing is damaged. It's usually a total loss. There's nothing left when you have a fire, and they do have you know, things do happen to these buildings. Uh, they're getting better with the building codes. They do a little better in the wind than they used to, but they still, there's not a lot of stability there. So in the wind, they can have a little bit of issue with these things too. Uh, so anyway, it's, that's kind of it. So non-combustible, maybe a little better than frame, but probably not. And uh, personally, I don't think it's much better than joisted masonry either. Now we move into what I start calling the superior construction classifications. And this is what all underwriters like. And I'm going to tell you why they like them as we go through this. Exterior walls constructed of masonry materials not less than four inches thick. Think about that, four inches thick. Floor and roof constructed with metal or other non-combustible materials. Generally concrete block, reinforced masonry, or tilt up concrete walls are combined with heavy steel framing. When you're watching a building being built, you'll see these heavy steel frames go up. Then what becomes interesting is how do, what kind of veneer, what do they put around those walls? Now, if they're putting concrete or even a concrete panel, it has to be four inches thick in order to meet this classification. A lot of times they're putting up thinner materials, and if it's too thin, doesn't meet the fire rating, it could actually be considered non-combustible, even though it looks like it's masonry non-combustible. This is something you got to kind of think about. But, you know, the bigger buildings, the schools, the prisons, uh, most of the strip centers that are being built, the big ones, uh, they are true MNC. In the southeast, we see an awful lot of the tilt-up construction taking place. And 
the vast majority of tilt up is classified as masonry non-combustible. Just to give you an idea too, these rates in builder's risk usually are about 50%, about half of the frame rate, sometimes less than that even, sometimes 30% of the frame rate. So there's a big difference in rating when you get to the M and C classification. Advantages, does really, really well at a fire. I'm not saying they're fireproof, but they are fire resistant. Uh, they're, they're very strong support. Uh, the integrity of the building is very strong. It withstand uh, just about anything we throw at it from the wind. Uh, you know, fires, they do very, very well. Disadvantages. It's very expensive to construct and repair. As I said, though, as the insurance costs continue to go up for frame, eventually there's a tipping point where even though it's more expensive to build initially, in the long run, it's going to save you money if you can do true M&C construction. Uh, it does contain steel, which loses strength at high temperatures, but it would take extremely high temperatures of an MNC building to do much damage. Obviously, the World Trade Center taught us that things do happen even to true MNC or fires at the buildings. Uh, so I think that, that kind of sums it up. The next classification is now you're almost completely superior as modified or semi-fire semi resistant. Very, very similar to masonry non-combustible but simply what we have is a higher fire rating. In order to be masonry non-combustible, you have to have a fire rating of at least an hour. In order to have to be classified as semi-fire resistive, you have to have a fire rating of up to two hours, between one and two hours. And we'll get to the last classification in a second. But as you look around, there's a lot of fire resistive structures in the big cities. You see the cranes everywhere, as you can see the pictures here. These are either semi-fire resistive or fire resistive. Obviously, it allows to build taller buildings. Frame structure, in Europe, they're playing around with building taller buildings, but in, in this country, we see four or five stories is about the max for frame. So usually when I look at a building, if it's taller than that, then I get a pretty good idea it's not frame. You know, no 10-story frame buildings out there yet. They're doing it in Europe, but not here yet. Might, might never do it here, I don't know. Uh, so the advantages of semi-fire resistive, greater height and area, and it's just uh, more resistant to fire. Once again, not proof, fireproof, but fire resistant. It is very expensive to build, and it, they always throw that in there. It provides a false sense of security. Hate to bring up the World Trade Center again, but none of us thought anything would ever happen to that building, and it can. And our last classification, and when you truly say superior construction, this is the best construction that is available today for us, and that is fire-resistive construction. And as I said earlier, usually even 20, 30% of the frame rate in builder's risk, permanent property about the same. So you can see it just uh, it performs a lot better when there is a fire. It's not fireproof. You have a lot of times though with fire-resistive, you'll have a partial fire in the parking garage or something, and it doesn't damage the whole building. Maybe you have some smoke damage, but it doesn't damage the structure. And so, you know, it mitigates the loss. So once again, uh, these are just very, very, you know, heavy steel construction uh, with very thick masonry walls with fire ratings of at least two hours or more. Kind of the same advantages and disadvantages of the other classes, but I will say, uh, once again, it allows greater height. Actually, you know, very almost no limit to how tall you can build a building if you use fire-resistive construction. But the one mistake we all make is, you know, saying, "Oh, nothing will ever happen to that building." Uh, it does happen. So, so hopefully, that kind of gives you a general overview of of construction classifications. And from a from an underwriting standpoint. Myself and the underwriting team here in Jacksonville, we go through this every day with agents. They will submit a risk and they'll tell us it's salt masonry non-combustible. It's very easy today to pull up that address and we'll look at it, we'll look at a picture of it, and sometimes we can look at the picture and tell you it's not masonry non-combustible. You know, we can tell you at best, maybe joist and masonry, and there's a good chance it's framed. So it's critical that we get it correct because we want to make sure it's classified correctly uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, many times we can look at a building, either new or existing building, and look at the cost per square foot. 
and it does vary dramatically around the country, but we can get a pretty good idea based on insurance to value of what that construction is. Obviously, fire resistant construction is the most expensive. So we can get a good idea of that. But a lot of this is, that's why we're trying to help you guys make sure the class is classified correctly going in. And we don't want to get in a situation where we classify it one way, we write the risk, we do a loss control report, and then we have to change the classification and raise the premium. That's not what we want to do. We want to get it right in the beginning. So once again, you know, you meet with your client. If it's a high-valued project, you might want to, you know, talk to the engineer or at least get a copy of the engineering report. That will tell you a lot of things uh, about what's going on. So, and a lot of times uh, a builder's build the same, you know, unless it's a new entity, this guy's been building these, this type of buildings for a while. So we can look at his past projects to get an idea of what he builds. Because rarely do you have a guy that builds masonry non-combustible strip centers and then he all of a sudden is going to build a frame house. So that usually doesn't happen that way. And just to reiterate the following questions, go through them very quickly. What materials make up the frame? Is it frame? Is it steel? Is it masonry? Is it light, light, light metal? What makes, up the, what makes up the frame? What makes up the interior, exterior, load-bearing walls? Is it frame? Is it steel? Is it masonry, uh, steel with masonry uh, enclosed? Uh, what materials make up the floor? Because if you have wood floors, depending on you know, the value of this and that, it could be, you know, that could affect the classification of the whole building. And the roof, the roof is always critical. If it's wood trusses, uh, at best it's joist and masonry. As long as they use wood in there, uh, you're not gonna get that, the superior classifications. And then if there's ever a question, uh, there's some kind of concrete panel that they're using that's due or some kind of, uh, you know, some kind of, uh, some, something new. There's always something new kind of panels being built. Then we go to the fire rating of the material. What is the fire rating? You know, one hour, two hours more. We need to know that. And once again, I just strongly encourage you if there's ever a situation where uh, there's a, you know, you don't quite know, uh, you know, give us a call. I'd like to talk about it. As you can see, I could talk about this all day, but for the sake of time, uh, I think we're going to get to the questions now. So. Yeah. So what we're going to do now is open up the open up the line for questions. Um, so if you will utilize the chat box in the lower right hand corner of your screen and send us um, any question that you have, or if you want us to contact you after this session, I mean that's where you would want to put in that information. But we're going to see, Jillian, if we have any questions that have been asked. Hey, Donna, we do have a couple that came through. Um, Jeff, there is someone that wants to know if you can explain masonry stucco. Elaborate on what that is. Sure. Like a, probably another thing that, that we see a lot of in the southeast, but I'm starting to see it everywhere I travel now. So you, what they do from an economic standpoint, ease of construction, uh, is they build a frame building. Let's just deal with a house. They build a frame house, and then from an aesthetic standpoint, they decide they want it to look more masonry. So they'll put a, a stucco veneer, uh, or we have uh, exterior insulation finishing systems, eaves, synthetic stucco. It's almost like a skin that they put over the building. That's what a veneer is. Uh, sometimes they put brick, so it's a brick veneer. That does not change the classification. That is still a frame building because of the the materials that are used in the load-bearing walls frame, correct? Hopefully that helps. Okay, um, a couple more questions came in. There's quite a few asking about the presentation and a copy of the presentation. Um, and yes, this will be available. This is being recorded and it um, we will send it out via email. We'll send out the presentation as well as the recording and it will also be available on our website later this week. Um, so just look out for that email and you'll have access to it. Um, additional questions. Somebody would um, somebody says, would the following be joisted masonry? They said a building is a 100% brick exterior with a wood stud wall construction. All right. So then, what I would do, and I think it's a little tricky, but it's because many times the load bearing walls are what we go to initially. So if the load bearing walls are solid brick, no wood in the load bearing walls. The only wood is maybe in some interior walls where they had some rooms and put drywall up. And there's some interior walls that are wood. 
And and then in this case, let's just say the trusses are wood. Uh, that possibly would be joist and masonry. I'm trying, I sound like a politician now, but as long as the walls are solid brick or solid masonry, then we could probably do joist and masonry. Okay. Um, another question. How do you rate EIFS cladding for wind and fire? That's exactly what I said earlier. EIFS, Exterior Insulation Finishing System. Uh, my favorite thing. Not really. I'm being facetious there. It's a, it's a nightmare from a GL standpoint, as the agents know. Uh, that is a classic uh, masonry veneer product that is usually put over uh, wood frame. I have seen it put over concrete blocks sometimes. So it could be if it's put over a frame, then it's a frame building. If it's put over a concrete block, then it probably is going to be joisted masonry. So it could go either way. Okay. Um, before I go through the next question, I just wanted to reiterate. I know a couple people have their hands raised, um, and we can't open the lines because of the number of people we have on the call. So if you will utilize the question chat box, then I can relay your questions to Jeff and Donna. Um, next question came in. Are you open for a residential builder's risk in Connecticut? And if so, what are your coastal guidelines? Interesting, too. I was going to try to do my best to not market our product. I want to make this educational. But uh, yes, we're open for residential in Connecticut and our guidelines. Uh, give us a call. We'll get our contact information and we'll go through that with you. But we do write, we have coastal capacity in Connecticut. Okay. Um, can you please explain what you mean by underwriting to the weakest point of the structure? Absolutely. This is, it takes me way back in time. I was a property underwriter back in the day. Uh, Let's say we have, the easiest are those mixed constructions that they build in California. They build them all the time. The first two floors are a parking garage, and it's true masonry non-combustible. You know, it's steel and concrete. But then they decided to build two more floors on top of that, and from a cost standpoint, they use frame. So even though half the building is M and C, the other half has frame. So, you know, logic would say, okay, let's rate it half and half. That's not the way property underwriting works. So with the way property underwriters look at that, they say, what is the weakest point of that building? It's the frame. So the entire building is classified as a frame building, even though half of it is masonry non-combustible. That doesn't matter. I have seen some where I, this is kind of confusing to me, but they will build a building that's true masonry steel, uh, but then they'll use wood trusses, I guess just because to save some money. So if you have a steel or a masonry building, but you decide to use wood trusses, uh, you know, at best you have a joisted masonry building now. You cannot have an M&C building with wood in the, in the walls and the, the, the roof. It doesn't work that way. The weakest point, whatever the weakest point is, that's the classification. Okay, I know we're coming up on time. So one final question. Um, and Jeff, this does include our coverages again. Does the coastal coverage include wind and hail? Yeah, that's, uh, you know, we, we, we are now, uh, we're in 49 states admitted. Uh, we write business from Maine to Texas on the coast. Uh, so we are open for business. We have capacity in these coastal areas. Uh, and I can't answer the question like everywhere, but we do have mandatory wind deductibles in certain areas. Our general rule of thumb is if the structure is within a thousand feet of the coast, uh, and then we look at it very closely. So I mean, it's kind of a we we look at these things closely, risk by risk. But yes, we do right on the on the coast, uh, and we do right frame on the coast. I wish everything was masonry non-combustible, but unfortunately, it's not. So uh, in order to be a viable program, we do right frame, uh, and we do have coastal capacity. Hopefully, that answers the question. Okay. We are good to go on our side. Well, I appreciate everybody's time.